Oh, hi! You caught me protecting my neighborhood from werewolves. You know, speaking of wolfmen, let's talk about Marv Wolfman. Hello, welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. Let's talk about a great writer today. A writer who was entrusted with revising the entire DC Comics universe. A writer who petitioned for creators' rights. A writer who created an anti-drug comic book for Keebler Cookies. Okay, we'll come back to that, but this is a guy who is respected, who has been working consistently in comics since the 1960s, and who has created some of the most memorable superheroes and supervillains out there. Who exactly am I talking about? Roll that beautiful bean footage. The first member of Sandman's family to appear in comics, Destiny, Blade the Vampire Hunter, Daredevil's enemy, Bullseye. Teen Titans members Raven, Starfire, and Cyborg. The sometimes supervillain, sometime anti-hero, Deathstroke the Terminator. The third Robin, Tim Drake. I'm talking about Marv Wolfman. Marv Wolfman was born in Brooklyn in 1946 and attended New York's School of Art and Design with the original goal of being a cartoonist. He became friends with Len Wein, a future writer and collaborator in comics. The two took a tour of DC's offices, which they used to offer once a week. From there, he created a fanzine called Stories of Suspense, and issue two from 1965 is one of the earliest printed stories by Stephen King. Marvin Len broke into DC Comics as co-writers for fill-in issues of Blackhawk, Showcase, and Teen Titans. But almost before he'd begun, Marv Wolfman nearly got himself blacklisted from working at DC. His fill-in story for Teen Titans, co-written with his friend Len Wein, introduced an African-American superhero. That would have been DC's first black superhero. The issue was enthusiastically illustrated by Nick Carty and approved by editor Dick Giordano and Vice President Erwin Donenfeld. But then there was a changing of editorial roles, and Carmine Infantino became the editorial director. He nixed the story towards the last minute. Neil Adams stepped in and offered to rewrite and edit it down. Ween and Wolfman were irate, but Adams explained that they were about to be fired and banned from working at DC if they acted like this, and they relented. Infantino feared that the comic wouldn't sell down in the South. To put this in context, it was 1969, and tensions in America were very high, with the Vietnam War dividing people politically. Now, Wolfman was an admitted young liberal, and he wanted the comic books he wrote to reflect the world he saw around him. To DC's credit, uh, circulation was down, and they did realize that they needed new young blood like Marv Wolfman, and that's why they were hiring guys like him. But, at the same time, the editorial staff was a lot older and more conservative, so there was a generational gap in place at DC Comics at this point in time. The published issue removed the new black superhero, and DC wouldn't get black superheroes until Tyrock in 1976 and Black Lightning in 1977. According to Neil Adams, the Nick Carty cover was kept, but touched up, and the gang approaching the Teen Titans was given a blue color wash to hide that they had originally been drawn as black men. Meanwhile, Wolfman was not in favor with the old guard, but remained friendly with editors Dick Giordano and Joe Orlando, who would give him jobs quietly. And it was DC's policy at this point in time not to print credits, so it shouldn't have been too big a deal that Wolfman was quietly getting these jobs. But then, almost by accident, Wolfman ended up helping creators' rights take a big step forward. The Comics Code Authority was formed in the 50s by various comics publishers in a bid to preemptively prove to Congress that they were not communist, and the stamp they'd put on their titles assured parents that nothing unwholesome would be found in comics bearing the Comics Code seal. The publishers took this opportunity to even say that you couldn't use words like vampire or wolfman in your comic, presumably to put EC Comics' super popular horror comics out of business. 
which was successful. The code was formed in 1954, but in January of 1970, writer Jerry Conway wondered, couldn't you print Wolfman if it was actually someone's name? In a framing story at the beginning of House of Secrets number 83, Abel, the host of the book, says that he was told a story by a wandering Wolfman as a type of pun. The following story was written by Marv Wolfman. In order to get the comics code to approve the book, the next page had to credit writer Marv Wolfman. And of course, once he had his credit, everyone wanted one. And by issue 87 of the comic, the title page looked like this, showing who the creators on the book were. Still, Wolfman wasn't getting enough regular work at DC. And in 1972, he went to work for Marvel under his mentor, Roy Thomas, who was the editor-in-chief at the time. The Comics Code had relaxed some of its standards, and Marvel recently launched a vampire book called Tomb of Dracula. Marv Wolfman took over writing the title with issue 7, and wrote until the final issue, number 70. In issue number 10, Wolfman and artist Gene Colan created Blade the Vampire Hunter, who became a popular member of the supporting cast. All the issues were drawn by Colan, who has said that he shared a close working relationship with Wolfman, calling to go over the script every month. From 1975 to 1976, Wolfman was Marvel's editor-in-chief. He continued policies his predecessors had established, diversifying Marvel's line to include horror, martial arts, and comedy. In 1978, Jim Shooter became the new editor-in-chief at Marvel Comics, and he didn't get along with Marv Wolfman. He decided that Tomb of Dracula would be canceled. Marv Wolfman and Gene Colan started making plans to wrap things up. Uh, they decided that they would need three issues to wrap up the story, ending with issue number 72. Then Jim Shooter came in and said, no, it's going to end with issue number 70. This was after Gene Colan had already illustrated all three issues. Marv Wolfman pleaded and ended up getting a double size final issue, number 70, but he still had to cut over a dozen fully illustrated pages. Jim Shooter could be a bit of a jerk. We're going to have to talk about him soon in a future episode. In addition to writing the longest running comic book with a villain in the title role, Wolfman co created characters like Black Cat in Spider Man and Bullseye, an enemy for Daredevil. In 1980, he created a Godzilla story with Steve Ditko, but Marvel lost the rights to adapt the character, and they changed it to a Dragon Lord story. This was an original creation of Wolfman and Ditko. Dragon Lord was a samurai named Teiko Shimara, who gave his life in the 1500s to stop a massive dragon called the Wani, who was originally intended to be Godzilla. In the modern day, his descendant, also named Teiko, had studied sorcery to combat the Wani and successfully holds back the dragon who re-emerges after 500 years. Wolfman's most popular Marvel creation is arguably Blade the Vampire Hunter. In 1998, just before the live-action movie adaptation launched, Marv Wolfman actually sued Marvel, New Line Cinema, and parent company Warner Brothers for $35 million saying that he had created Blade under a non-traditional contract. It wasn't his usual work-for-hire contract. And that he had given Marvel permission for each subsequent use of Blade. So he sued them, and it was a long, drawn-out trial. But in November of 2000, the judge issued his final ruling in favor of Marvel. The judge argued that the subsequent uses of Blade uh, consisted of significantly differentiating the character from his original creation. So Marvel was in the right. It set a bad precedent for comics creators' rights. In 1980, Wolfman left Marvel after becoming frustrated with the policies of their new publisher, Cadence. His friends Roy Thomas and Len Wein had already left. Wolfman returned to DC and relaunched the Teen Titans title with artist George Perez. It would become his most enduring work. Wolfman and Perez created new heroes Cyborg, Starfire, and Raven for the team. They also created Deathstroke, possibly their most popular co-creation. Deathstroke began as an archenemy for the Titans, but over Wolfman's very long run, eventually ended up as an occasional ally. It can't be overstated how important New Teen Titans was for DC. 
It helped them build back a lot of their lost readership, and was the second most popular comic on the stands after X-Men. In fact, in 1982, the two comics had a crossover, written by X-Men's Chris Claremont, and the plan was for Wolfman and Perez to do a second issue in 1983. But Marvel and DC stopped talking, and didn't team up again for a crossover until the late 90s. One amusing Titans comic that came out during this time was an anti-drug issue that was actually sponsored by Keebler. After the issue was already illustrated, DC Comics realized that they had licensed Robin to Nabisco, so he couldn't appear in the comic by cookie rival Keebler. So even though Robin was the leader of the Teen Titans, he just doesn't appear in this issue, and instead everybody's taking orders from this brand new generic character named The Protector. He's just a, as I said, generic, nice guy, a good athlete, and unfortunately his little cousin had just died from drug use. It was crazy. Basically, uh, Dick Giordano had to go back in and re-ink the issue so that it was The Protector instead of Robin. Uh, Wolfman and Perez do their best, but it is a promotional comic, so don't expect too much out of it. In 1985, DC Comics decided that with about 50 years of history behind their superheroes, it was time to reset things. They entrusted Marv Wolfman and George Perez to create the 12-issue series Crisis on Infinite Earths. This cosmic story brought together all the various parallel realities and timelines and featured many superheroes dying, including the Barry Allen Flash. It can't be overstated how big a deal this was in 1985. No comics publisher had decided to completely reset and start everything from scratch. The series also folded in new acquisitions DC had made, like the superheroes from the defunct Charlton Comics. It was a massive hit that managed to feature every DC Comics character and still have a coherent and compelling story. Following Crisis, Wolfman had a hand in redesigning Superman's villain Lex Luthor to be a powerful businessman instead of a mad scientist. By the tail end of the 80s, DC relieved Wolfman of his editorial duties after an argument over a proposed rating system and just had him write comics like Teen Titans. Editorial at one point decided that Teen Titans would be sold only to the direct market comic book stores and taken off of newspaper and convenience store shelves. The goal was to bolster the relatively new market for selling comics, but long term probably hurt the continued growth of comics by phasing out a sales channel. Wolfman started to get burnt out. In the 1990s, Wolfman started focusing more on writing for cartoons like DuckTales and Beast Machines. In the 2000s, he worked on video games and novelizations of comics. Nevertheless, he continues to write the occasional comic at DC. Marv Wolfman has had an incredible career over six decades working in comics. He's probably best known for his ability to juggle large casts of characters across a title, giving them each unique personalities, motivations, and storylines, as well as seeding in subplots that will pay off later. So he's well known for dealing with team books, I would say. Uh, he's probably best known for coming up with big, interesting plots as compared to character development. That said, he's created a number of enduring and memorable superheroes and supervillains. Some really big ones. I think that Marv Wolfman has had an amazing career, and if you're curious where to start reading his stuff, I would suggest Tomb of Dracula and Teen Titans, because he basically starts at the beginning and takes those all the way through to the end. Those are, those are really great runs that you can learn about Marv Wolfman's work for. All right, let's see if we've got any uh, fan art this week. I have one piece of fan art this week to share from Vin Tang. It looks like it's based on an early episode I had where I discussed Naoki Urasawa, one of my favorite creators. I love this piece, Vin. As the only new submission, I will pull a gachapon from the prize bag. These all come directly from Japan where I picked them up personally. Let's see what you got. All right, let's see. Uh, something small and weird. It's some sort of a monster. It might be a Godzilla monster. You can't quite see it through there. But Vin, I will get your address and mail this out to you. Thank you so much. Uh, if you want to send some fan art, 
uh, specifically about this show, uh, send it to this address, comictropes at gmail.com. I'll feature anything I get. You'll be in the running for winning a Gachapon prize. I draw one every week, randomly. And uh, yeah, if you have like a website or social media, uh, include those links in your email and I'll, I'll print those as well. Folks, I had a great time talking about Marv Wolfman this week. He's ha had a really interesting career. Uh, I was a huge fan of Crisis on Infinite Earths when I was young. That just felt like mind-blowingly epic. Uh, and I was also a big fan of his run on Teen Titans. Uh, I've recently started reading the Tomb of Dracula stuff that he wrote through the 70s, and it's pretty wild good stuff. It, it's, it's, yeah, it's very unique to sort of have a villain in the title role. Uh, so anyway, it's, a, it's cool stuff. I recommend it, and uh, I appreciate you watching. Hey, you know what? Uh, until I see you next time, keep reading comics.